Good evening, software engineers. My green screen's not working right. I'm grumpy. Look at this. It's like the sun is like there. And look at my forehead. Like when I'm disappearing into the Disney world. And then there's, oh, wrong side. And there's this. I was all excited. I was going to do cool things. And can't get my green screen to work right. Well, I guess technically it's just a piece of cloth. Okay, even then I'm, I'm having trouble. Because I'm not getting it to, to fall correctly. And it's not. Ah. We'll find it. I'll just be in front of the greens. <laughs> I'll get it working eventually. I don't know. But anyway, good evening. I hope you're doing well today. Um, had a wonderful Q&A session earlier today. I posted a recap of that. So hopefully you'll take a look at that. The, the, the one question I think most people would be most interested in is my discussion about um, grading the project and how I grade for individuals. My goodness, it's like something sat on my glasses. Can't see through it. It's almost like that the green screen's messed up and I smashed my face with my hands. So anyway, folks, let's uh, talk a little bit about what we're going to talk about today. Uh, engineering software security is this week. Now, first thing I want to make sure you know is that this is not dark arts. This is not intro to cyber, nothing like that. We're not going to talk about buffer overflow attacks or, or um, man in the middle or how any of these attacks work. What we're going to talk about is how does software security get introduced into the software life cycle? So that's how we're going to start talking about. We're talking about design decisions, how security is a non-functional requirement. And then we're going to talk about the basic security principles that we care about as software engineers. So that's the game plan for, for this first video. Later videos we'll get um, through the rest of the, the, the decks to talk about how everything's going. So that's the plan. Let's get to it. Jump back to lecture slides, make sure that they change. There we go. So we make design trade-offs. Whenever we are going about building a piece of software, we have to make decisions of, uh, whenever we come down to a point where we says, okay, we can either use this framework or this framework. Well, why might you choose one aspect or another? Why would you choose um, Django over one of those other frameworks that you were looking at when we did the framework exercise? Now, let's go to the assumption that they both work, okay? Let's just go to the assumption that either option would actually produce working software, would allow you to actually complete the project that you want to do. What are some things you might think about that um, here's a reason why I'd pick one or another? Think. Think harder. I heard that eye roll. Okay, good. What did you come up with? Did you think about something like maybe the programming language? You know, if your entire team knows Python and someone comes in and says, hey, let's do Ruby on Rails, you might look at that person and go, no, because you're introducing the potential for more defects because everyone has to learn a new system when they're already experts at, at Python. So that's a reason you might pick one or another, the comfort, how comfortable you are with the language. Maybe you care about which packages are available. Maybe you care about which ones have a better... Uh, support in the, in, in, the, in, the, in the world. Those are the things we talked about in the framework example. But here's some other things you might want to think about. Efficiency, um, flexibility, maintainability, security, we'll get to it, usability, scalability, ease or cost of implementation. So, you know, there are a whole f factor, a whole set of reasons why you would choose one framework as a, over another, one design decision as opposed to another. And, and, and the framework example is, is, is almost too big for this. Maybe it's down to, I'm trying to decide whether to use this particular algorithm or this particular algorithm. You know, th these, this could be any design decision that you're trying to make. There are reasons to pick one as opposed to another. So security is one of those. Sometimes you're going to look at two solutions and say, I really should go with this one because it is going to be more secure. Now, the definition of what we mean by more secure, we're going to get to because um, that actually has several different interpretations. Now, in your projects, 
you didn't really do a design document. I mean, all all deference to the the software architects out there. Maybe you did some some sketches, some high level stuff. The architecture documents that you actually did for this class are more a reflection of what you did, not a planning for what you should do. It's pretty hard in a one semester class in order to do all of the phases of development in the proper order and still get through the entire material at the same time we're building the project. So we do make some, you know, we suspend disbelief a bit. So, you know, you, you did that after the fact. But at some point you did decide what should your models be? What should the layout be? What should the views be? How, how does data flow? You had to make those decisions. Now, when you were making those decisions, did you ever think about security? I mean, realistically, you know that this is a school project. You know that this is going to me and not, you know, general release. Um, you're probably not storing anyone's PII, personally identifiable information. You're probably not going to take the project as is and just release it to the public. So you probably didn't. That's okay. Obviously, as you move into industry, it becomes less okay. And you do need to start thinking about when you make a design decision, what are the security implement, implement, oh my gosh, I'm talking. Impl Ah, the security implications, got it, of those decisions. <laughs> it's the green screen. The green screens messed me up. So security is, is one of those non-functional requirements that's really hard to manage because like all NFRs, it's not something that's like, I'm going to go build the security module and be done. Unfortunately, some teams think that's the way it does work and they go by, hey, I bought a firewall module check security off the list. No, that's not how it works. Um, it's something that you have to con completely think about the entire time, even though um, sometimes people don't, right? You know, there is that pressure. We've got to focus on the features. We have to have something to show the users, show the customers, show the people that are paying us to build the software. And it's hard to say, well, I have made sure that this thing is protected against cross-site scripting attacks and SQL injection attacks. And the customer goes, yeah, good. I mean, that's what you should be doing anyway, right? Now show me the bling. Show me the, you know, show me that cool feature that's going to land me new users type thing. So there is very, very real pressure to build those features that, you know, have the splash. Not necessarily security, depending on the project you're building, of course, but you know, we need to pay more attention to it. So let's think about things that you need to consider as a software engineer. First and foremost, security is not a wrapper. It is not something that you build a piece of software and then you, then you say, I will now add the security force field around it and it now makes my software nice and secure. That's not how it works. It has to be baked in from the beginning. It has to be something that you address the entire time throughout the entire software lifecycle. It's not an add-on. It's not a module, okay? So you have to think about what your users could do. And this could be intentional or unintentional. Remember, Sheriff's Rule of Software, number one, your users hate you. Um, they are going to do whatever they can, intentionally or unintentionally, to try and break your software. So that brings us to kind of the core security principles that we think about when engineering uh, software. Um, they're traditionally called the CIA principles. Uh, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Um, there's a slightly different version of this that I, that I teach when I do uh, the mobile class, but in general, it, it does come down to these things. Um, confidentiality, can only the people who are supposed to view the information, view the information and not anyone else. Integrity, is the data an accurate representation of the world as it is? In other words, is anyone feeding you false information or the data has changed or something like that? And then availability, is the data there? You know, it, it, you know denial of service attack or, or the system's been taken down or something along those lines. So can only the people who see it, supposed to see it, has it changed? And then is it available? So I'm um, going into these a little bit more, a little deeper. Let's talk about confidentiality. One of the core concepts in, in, in confidentiality is the difference between authentication and authorization. Okay. Authentication is making sure that two parties 
sorry microphone, that two parties are who they say they are. Now, what are different ways you can do this? The most common way is a combination of an identifier and a secret code. Yes, the username and password is the most common way of doing authentication. Now, there's a lot of flaws to, to that form of authentication. Namely, people use one, two, three, four, five, or password, or their kid's birthday, or they use a password that is way too freaking easy. Or how many of you use the same password on multiple websites? I know that you do, because we all do. Um, well, maybe not all of us. Hopefully many of you take advantage of something like LastPass that the university provides. I use one password, uh, not literally one password. It's the numeral one and then the word pass. It's a program like LastPass, okay? It's just a Mac one uh, that I, I just prefer. But that's a, a program, you know, that will generate passwords for you and then keep them in a secure location. And then you only have to remember the one password to get into your vault in order to use them. Now, that is one form of authentication. Now, authentication basically means I have a thing that proves that I am me. Biometrics is another one of these. Um, if you have a Windows machine, maybe you have the Hello Windows, you know, the, the camera like says, hi, and then hello, and it logs you in. That's one way you, uh, of doing that. Fingerprint identification, that's another one. Um, you know, touch ID, face ID, that is all a form of authentication. Um, another form is I have a thing that proves who I am, such as your certificate, like your net badge certificate. That should be something that only exists on your computer itself. And these are all very good forms of authentication because it's not something that's easily copied or easily, um, you know, used by someone else potentially. Um, when one layer of authentication doesn't work, we add a second layer of authentication. You have all had to pick up your phones and do, um, duo. Oh, wow. It is really, it's not that late sheriff. Come on, man. You like my, like my animal crossing background. Isn't that nice? Sammy's obsessed with Animal Crossing. In a good way. We're having fun. We're having fun. So that's all authentication. Next is authorization. Once you've verified a, a, the entity is who they say they are, what are they allowed to do? Okay. So this is, I've logged in to Sys as me, as a professor. When I log into Sys as me, I see certain things. I can see all of my advisees courses. I can see the courses that I teach. I have the ability to remove holds. There's that. Now, I also have the ability to log into Sys with a different username and password that gives me the ability to look up any student's record. And that's, you know, something I had to apply for. They had to vet me, take blood, swear to Thomas Jefferson. I'd never, you know, look up Katie Couric's grades, you know, that sort of thing. Um, so, uh, that's a different, I'm proving myself in a different way because I have to use other methods to prove I'm in a secure location. I have to log in through a high security VPN, but then I'm authorized to do other things. So in your apps, your username and password, the standard, you know, when you, when you uh, are using the Google OAuth thing, that is a form of authentication, technically through authorization. OAuth is weird. Uh, basically it says um, you logged in, therefore you are authorized to see your personal information so i know that you are you yeah kind of trippy but um that verifies who you are then inside your system you probably have on some i mean you can only view your own for information you can only see the books you're selling you can only see your personal dashboard right so that is the authorization component now encryption while good is very good at protecting data at rest. So like when data is in a database, in case anyone happens to get into your database, for instance, you should never store anyone's password in a database. You should store an, an, a hash of it, an encryption of it of some kind, never the actual text itself, because that's super bad, right? Now that's encryption at rest, and then there's encryption in transit, right? So this would be HTTPS. This would be when someone is connecting to your system that you do the good old hand, the handshake and you know it's a secure connection. So there you go. Um, in your project, what are the implications of any sort of major issues? I mean, personal dashboard folks, you probably have some information in there that could be considered sensitive, potentially maybe some great information. 
um, that would be considered sensitive uh, under FERPA. Um, textbook, probably not. Um, quick tutor, it could be embarrassing potentially to some people if they had to ask for a tutor for some things. I mean, people react different ways. So these are reasons that you would want to be able to protect the data. So this comes back to the idea of risk modeling and threat assessment, right? So when we think about these potential risks, we say, okay, what is the worst thing that happens if someone gets into someone else's personal dashboard, right? What are the potential risks? Well, I could find out someone else's grade. Okay, what's the likelihood of that happening? I mean, in a student project, probably not very high. No one's probably going out and hacking your Heroku installations. But, you know, if this is out in public, how likely is it? Probably not terribly likely, probably. I mean... Maybe you have someone who's trying to prank on someone or, ooh, I bet this person's been cheating. I, eh, I don't really know. So maybe we don't prioritize this risk too terribly, too terribly much. Or maybe this is an app that I am hosting and as a state employee, as someone who works for the University of Virginia, uh, there are federal laws that govern what I have to do to protect people's grades. So I have to care very much. Um, so that would be something I'd have to think about. And then I'd have to plan for that accordingly. What are the ways that I'm trying to protect the data? How am I verifying that a person is who they say are? What are the authentication methods that I am using? What are the authorization methods that I'm using? How am I protecting the data at rest at the data in transfer? And so for every risk that you see when you examine a piece of data in your system, then you should think about how do I ensure that only the person who's supposed to be seeing this data can see this data. There you go. Now, integrity is all about, is the data correct? Um, if I went in and changed a grade from a, if, if someone got into SIS somehow and changed someone else's grade from an A to a B, or a to, that would be, that's a lame prank. Uh, a to an F, that's just mean, F to an A, now we're talking. Um, what are, again, the likelihood of that happening? Um, what, what is the potential risks of that? What are the potential risks in your own project? Again, probably not terribly high, but how do we ensure integrity? Well, we start with the confidentiality. How do you verify the authentication and the authorization in order to make sure someone can see the data that they're trying to get to? But for integrity, we can also do things like backups. We can do things like snapshots. We can do things like logs. So whenever something changes to a sensitive piece of data, we can log that change with who made the change so we can trace back to see what might have happened. This is pretty important when we're doing things like uh, online transactions. Um, let's say, for instance, someone tried to grab a command that was sent to purchase some stocks or sell some stocks. And if someone was able to grab that transmission and resend it multiple times, they could do a lot of harm, right? How do we know that it is a valid request? Well, that's why you have some, some of these extra logging mechanisms and receipt mechanisms to ensure that you're not double doing something or you're not, someone hasn't grabbed a command and is reissuing it later or something like that. You are verifying the integrity that it is the correct command for the correct time. Even if, even if um, someone has stolen the authentication methodology, maybe there's a, there's a new token that has to be issued. There has to be a new authorization that is issued in order to execute that command. And how does this differ for data at rest versus data in transit? Uh, integrity is also um, ensured by encryption. Right, So we can ensure that data at rest stays and in transit um, can stay correct by encrypting it and maybe um, storing, or we could do a signature. That's another way of doing things, something like this. So if you take a message and you encrypt it with your pri with you encrypt it with your private key then anyone can un can decrypt it with your public key you can verify that the message has not changed that was not explained very well um in mobile development when someone wants to release an android app or an ios app you want to make sure that the code has not been changed since the developers released the app. You don't want someone to have gotten the app and installed something in it that's gonna grab people's personal information. So in order to release the app on the App Store or the iOS Store, 
there or the Play Store, um, the requirement is you take the app you built and you take a hash of it. So you take this much code and you squish okay, down to a unique hash. Then in order to publish on those stores, you have to have a certificate, much like the certificate you use to log into NetBadge, not that exact one, but very similar, to encrypt that hash with the certificate that only you should have and include that with your app. This is done automatically, by the way. So then when a, 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 um, a, an Android phone tries to install that app, it will grab the encrypted hash off the bottom, decrypt it with the other half of your, your key, the thing that you have registered with Google, so they know that this is who you are, and they then the app hashes it hashes the app itself too, and then compares those two hashes. If they're the same, the code hasn't changed, the integrity is there, and the app is allowed to run. Um, for an iOS device, the interesting thing about this is that that signature has to come from Apple unless you jailbreak. So a jailbroken iPhone basically says you're allowed to sign with anyone's key, not just Apple's key, and that's why it allows you to install stuff that doesn't come through the App Store. Now, availability is exactly what it sounds like. Can you ensure that everything is there when you need it? Um, you want to avoid that if you know, one hard drive goes down, if one server goes down, if one anything goes down, your app is toast. The nice thing about doing things on a service like Heroku or Azure or you know, any of the other cloud services is they have the ability to turn on and off machines, increase dynos, reduce dynos, so that the availability is not really a major issue unless you're Netflix in a pandemic. Um, or, or any other service that's trying to, bait, or Zoom in a pandemic. Oh my gosh, Zoom. Um, because of the amount of traffic that's going through it, right? So if something does break, how do you recover the data? The logging that you do for integrity is also very helpful for uh, availability, helps you to rebuild the system. Um, you also want to think about, from a DevOps perspective, where are you... Um, uh, how how are, how is your app and the hardware that it's running on working synergistically? Uh, is your app intended to be continuously making backups on other machines? Is it building on a system that is fault fault tolerant? Is it making it, does it have multiple instances of the database in case one instance of the database goes down? There's a lot of things you can do to add capacity to the back end to ensure that the front end is always available. Thankfully. A lot of this is handled by these cloud providers now. Um, because of this idea of platform as a service or infrastructure as a service, app, app designers, app developers um, can focus much more readily on just the app itself and not everything else around it. So that's our intro here to um, what we're gonna be talking about as far as engineering software security goes. What do we care about? We care about when we get to uh, when we start designing software, we have to make decisions. Do we decide to go for the faster route? Do we decide to go for the route that, of the um, the language that we know? Are we going to do the latest, greatest, am most amazing thing? But we have we thought about, are there security concerns? And is there a reason to make one design decision as opposed to another? And when you make those design decisions, are you considering how do you do confidentiality, integrity, and availability? Are you thinking about how you're going to authenticate people and authorize they can only see the data that they want to see? How are you verifying that the data has not changed in any way and that you're making sure your system stays online? With Django and Heroku um, and the way that we have built our projects, a fair amount of this comes packaged in, right? User accounts come packaged in. Um, we're using the Google OAuth, using you know, external services comes packaged in. Heroku gives the ability to do more of the availability stuff. Um, integrity, you're probably not doing a ton of. You're probably not doing any sort of logging or any sort of extra things to validate when data changes. But and I'm not asking you to do that. Uh, but it's something that you need to think about. You know, how are you going to ensure only people who are supposed to see data see it? Make sure the data that they see is the correct data and hasn't been altered in any way, and then it's available whenever they want to see it. So, I'll work on the green screen.
<sighs> Not like I don't have a ton of other things to do anyway. Uh, by the way, uh, Quiz 3 is back. Scores were very good. Great job. If you have any questions, let us know. And I'll catch you in the next video. Have a good one. Bye.